Hello, everyone. This is the Convergence Forum, where the international, intercommunalist convergence, intercommunalist in the sense of uh, Dr. Uh, Newton. And uh, we are here to discuss the current uh, crises that are being presented to the uh, world revolutionary movements. And uh, we are blessed with the presence of Red Wasp in Belgium and with uh, Cara in the not so great Britain. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a sad uh, sort of, you know, beginning today to today's day because of the assassination of uh, Hezbollah chief Nasrallah. And uh, he himself was uh, a substitute for the previous uh, uh, chairperson of the uh, Hezbollah movement who was assassinated as well. So this is uh, something that is uh, not a fatal blow at all, but certainly a setback. And we wish to commemorate his uh, contribution to the revolutionary struggle of the Lebanese people. Yes, Red Was. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah rahman rahim In name of um, Allah, the most merciful, uh, the most uh, al-Rahim. Um, on September 27th, yesterday, um, Comrade Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, was assassinated by a Zionist airstrike targeting Hezbollah's headquarters in Be uh, Beirut. This brutal act of violence aimed to silence one of the most steadfast leaders of the resistance, but has only served to amplify his legacy as a symbol of unwavering defiance and a beacon of hope for the oppressed. The martyrdom of Comrade Nasrallah stands as a testament to the desperation and the moral bankruptcy of the Zionist settler colonial state as it approaches its final and most brutal phase. Born in 1960 in the impoverished neighborhoods of Beirut, Sayyid, has uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah rose to prominence as a key figure in the Lebanese resistance. He assumed leadership of Hezbollah in 1992, following the assassination of the, 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 the former leader Sayyid Abbas al masawi um, by the Zionist regime also. Hezbollah emerged as a response to the Zionist invasion of Lebanon in uh, 1982, initially founded as a grassroots movement to resist the occupation of, uh, Lebanese terror, uh, of the Lebanese territory. Under, Nasrallah's, under Nasrallah's leadership, however, Hezbollah evolved into a, both a formidable political force and a resistance movement representing the oppressed of Lebanon. Combining military strategy with social outreach, Hezbollah successfully liberated southern Lebanon in the year 2000, becoming a symbol of resilience and a bastion of hope for the marginalized communities in Lebanon and throughout the region. The coast of resistance was not unknown to Comrade Nasrallah. His eldest son, Mohammed Hadi Nasrallah, he became a martyr in 1997 at the age of 18. He was killed while fighting the Zionist forces in southern Lebanon. Several other, fam several other family members of uh, Comrade Nasrallah also fell victim to the relentless aggression of the Zionist entity. These sacrifices, these sacrifices only... Um, deepened uh, his commitment to the cause of liberation, further embodying the spirit of steadfastness that characterized his leadership. The pain of personal loss transformed into steadfast defiance was a mark of Nasrallah's devotion to justice. Comrade Nasrallah was more than a military and a political leader. He was also a spiritual guide whose message transcended sectarian divides. While he held the title of Sayyid within the, uh, the Shia community, his words and actions spoke to all the oppressed people in Lebanon. He became a national figure, bridging the divisions that the Zionist colonial project sought to exploit. Large numbers of Sunni Muslim and Christian communities also revered him as a hero, seeing in him a defender of Lebanon's sovereignty and dignity. His leadership during the 2006 Lebanon wars, as well as his instrumental role in the defeat of Daesh, uh, of the, the Islamic State, uh, the fascist Islamic State, so-called Islamic, demonstrated his deep commitment to the defense of Lebanon and its people, making him a beloved figure beyond the confines of religious identity. The martyrdom of comrade Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah elicited widespread reactions from leaders uh, of the resistance and from international political figures. The leader of Iraq's national wisdom movement, 
Sayyid Ammar al-Hakim um, called his dad an ir irreparable loss, but he emphasized that the path of resistance will continue until victory is achieved. The Belgian-Lebanese activist and political thinker Diab Abu Yahya uh, described Nasrallah as a historical leader of the resistance, whose aura, brilliance and kindness are unfor uh, unforgettable. Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani, a highly respected Shi'i authority in Iraq, praised him as a symbol of resistance. Leaders as the Turkish President Erdogan and the Russian Foreign Minister condemned the assassination as a dangerous escalation, reflecting the significance of Comrade Nasrallah's life and sacrifice on both regional and global levels. Martyrdom is a profound concept. It goes beyond the simple notion of death. It's the ultimate act of bearing witness against tyranny, of transforming the individual sacrifice into a collective call for justice. The words martyrdom, marturos in Greek, or shahid in uh, Arabic, literally means witnessing. Comrade Nasrallah's martyrdom, like those of Comrade Jesus, peace be upon him, and Comrade Hussein, peace be upon him, is an exposure of the oppressor's brutality and his moral, uh, moral failure. The martyrdom of Comrade Jesus, peace be upon him, crucified by the Roman Empire, laid bare the fundamental nature of imperial violence, a force willing to destroy innocence to maintain its hold on power. His death became, the la became a lasting testament, a lasting testimony against all oppression, a beacon of justice that continued to inspire resistance among the downtrodden. Similarly, Hussein's martyrdom at Karbala was not, was not just a tragic loss, but an act of immense defiance against the Umayyad uh, caliphs, against the Umayyad regime. Hussein stood against injustice and oppression, knowing that his death would be a means to reveal the true face of tyranny. His martyrdom, like that of Comrade Jesus, continues to serve as a source of inspiration for the oppressed, a model of sacrifice that defines the very, existence, the very essence of resistance. Comrade Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah follows in this tradition. His assassination by the Zionist colonial regime was intended to crush the spirit of resistance, but instead, but instead it has amplified his message and unmasked the oppressor's true nature. In the tradition of revolutionary martyrdom, Comrade Nasrallah's death, far from being a defeat, becomes an eternal call to action, a testimony to the resilience and the power of the oppressed. The story of Karbala, the story of the martyrdom of Hussein, is not only about those who fell on the battlefield, but also about those who survived. People like Lady Zainab, uh, salam, the sister of uh, Imam Hussein, and his son Imam Ali Ibn Hussein, Imam Sajjad, um, they also were, uh, were uh, uh, martyrs, were witnesses. After the massacre, Zainab and Imam Sajjad were taken as captives to Yazid's court, to the court of the Caliph in Damascus. There they bore witness to the atrocities committed, fearlessly speaking the truth about what had transpired at Karbala. Lady, Zainab, Lady Zainab's eloquent defiance in Yazid's court revealed the moral corruption of the caliphs and turned what was meant to be a display of Yezid's power into a provo profound exposure of his brutality. The dialectical relationship between those who die and those who survive is crucial in understanding martyrdom. The fallen bear witness through their sacrifice, while the survivors bear, bear witness through their words and actions. Comrade Nasrallah's assassination similarly calls upon us to be the Zainabs and the Imam Sajjads of our time, to tell the truth about his sacrifice and to use our voice, voices to expose the tyranny and the, of the Zionist entity. The dialectical nature of martyrdom is about the relationship between those who give their lives and those who live on to tell the story. At Karbala, Hussein and his companions were martyred, but it was Lady Zainab and Imam Sajjad who ensured that their story would be remembered and would inspire uh, and would inspire future generations. Mm. The Zionist movement has long sought to eliminate its most focal and effective opponents. This began long before the official establishment of the Zionist state with the assassination of Jacob Israel de Haan in 1924. Mm. A queer, socialist and orthodox Hasidic Jewish anti-Zionist who was murdered for his outspoken opposition to the colonial project. Um, to all who read this, to all who hear this, um, we have to be the surviving martyrs of our time. We have to use every opportunity to tell the story of these brutal assassinations. Let the truth 
of these sacrifices echoed through every corner of the world, unmasking the oppressor and ensuring that the legacy of resistance live on. Hmm. Long live all the martyrs, um, long live comrade uh, Hassan Nasrallah. Hmm. That was beautiful. Long hmm. live comrade Nasrallah, long live all the martyrs. Yeah, long live their memory. That's yes, right. that reminds me of my mother's brother, who was a martyr as well, as a partisan, and then later uh, conscripted into the Red Army, and that's the last we heard of him. But he enabled my mother to escape from the Warsaw Ghetto. Mashallah. And she survived. And, you know, even though there are survivors of the Jewish Bund, does the Jewish left commemorate this of any survivors of the Jewish Bund? No. Does the left commemorate any survivors of the Jewish socialist the revolutionary tradition? No. <laughs> you know, and the Zionists certainly don't want to commemorate any, you know, surviving Bundists either. You know, so it's like a no nowhere world, you know, that uh, we, the survivors, uh, are living in, you know. And in Toronto, we had a large movement as well called the uh, Varsha Lodge Mutual Benefit Society. But we were never recognized by the uh, Canadian Jewish community. What it is, is the petty bourgeoisie and the imperial core has taken over a lot of the movement and they don't give a fuck about commemorating like any of the active revolutionaries or anyone who's living up to that tradition. You know, yeah. like they're, they're too busy with, with their hammer smashing down every colonized Marxist or otherwise revolutionary tradition that comes from who knows what knows place, especially trying to target the black uh, radical tradition, which is the one they're most scared of. I wonder why. Um, but because the penny bourgeoisie, they're not trying to do revolution. They're trying to they're trying to hybridize and like stabilize society through revolutionary voices. So they're smashing against any like interconnection that any of us are trying to build in the actual revolutionary left. And mm. what's it? I I find the chauvinism like reeks through society really fucking bad. Like being a lumpen proletarian in fucking like Marxist spaces and like just socialist spaces in general. And the first, like, it was like imperial core folk, them, you know, people from England or France or America. You, it can be really alienating because there can just be like a lot of people that just don't get what it's like to actually live in like the lowest class and they just talk pure shit and then try and tell you what your, your class position and what your experience is like and i'm like buddy i don't need you to tell me <laughs> i experience it every day <laughs> <laughs> like some petty bourgeois inexperienced fucking like Oh, I read a book. Like you know, reading is always good. But when I like when I say I've studied a topic, like I like to go a little deeper than just reading like some texts on it. You can like speak with people, engage one with book. the real world, and other stuff well, like that. Only... You know, these like scary concepts. That... <laughs> well, one only book. You know, the first book you read then must be it. <laughs> so. Well, the... Marxism is stop. so very simple, so very uncomplicated. As long as you keep within the, 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 the study room and you don't go in the neighborhood to see the real people and, and the real proletariat. Yeah. That's, you know, it, it, it's all about, uh, you know, do you not remember Lenin's position where he just said theory, theory, theory? Um, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, this is why, like, I always stress it to people, it, like, practice is said twice in Lenin's equation. He says it is, it is practice, theory, practice. Like theory is the the minor in the relationship, while praxis is the major, and that's the component relationship that these two exist within. And so theory is what helps keep defining and developing and like uh, advancing upon what we learn through praxis and what we gain engaging in new forms of praxis based on what we've learned from it. It is the it is the relationship between empirics and rational. I think that this is also because we were talking about it before um, we recorded um, this whole um, uh, focus on uh, theory, on, on 
to put it in a more theological uh, uh, um, language, on beliefs, on, on, on the ideas that you have in your head. Um, this um, idealism is actually one of the the, the, the most uh, profound distortions that the, 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 the Roman Empire was able to enter into Christianity. If you look at Judaism, if you look at Islam, if you look at Sikhism, if you look at um, these traditions, they're all about praxis. Um, I, 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 I've often had discussions with several different Jewish comrades or with several different Muslims. We have different ideas, but what matters is what you do with these ideas. And maybe your ideas in your head are completely different than mine. But if they lead you to a very similar praxis, then OK, your ideas are fine. Well, if you have the, the the greatest theory in your head, but it doesn't lead you to any praxis, or even worse, it leads you to 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 a counter-revolutionary praxis, your ideas are worthless. What's that? Um, the birth of modern materialist science comes directly from the lineage of Islamic mysticism. Islamic mysticism, even though it has the name mysticism, is a materialist form of science because mm -hmm. what the defining point of Islamic mysticism is is that Allah has created a world that has n these natural efficacies to it that and it has its own flow and function. Like He's not controlling every little cog that turns. Nature has a reality to it. So like this recognition of nature... And then this sort of like build up from it of this need to, okay, well, we as people with quite a caretaker ability have a responsibility of engaging with this nature in a materialistic fashion where in which we build, develop, break, destroy, create, you know, we meld the world in our image because we're the caretakers of the world. You know, Allah has like, um, you know, the whole universe to like kind of really can wrap themselves around. So like, um humanity has its purposes we're not just here to be drones you know uh, that's kind of the thing that people kind of mistake with um, religion and what we see is that these religions always get taken over by oppressors and so interpretations vastly differentiate with each other yes there was a conclusion that we had come to in the previous discussion that the the religions, although based upon you know the popular masses and working people, basically, in particular, you know, for example, Shabbos is the first day off you know the workers ever got in history. So, um, but you know we can see that you know religions can be corrupted by state institutions. Uh, the Roman Empire corrupted Christianity to serve its purposes as a state ideology, and eventually forming the nation state itself on the basis of a given democratic national identity then you know uh, uh judaism has been corrupted by zionism with zionism with its claims you know to have its legitimate legitimization in the teachings of judaism which is a false claim because uh, there was no such you know covenant made that they claim for that land and uh in islam as well we have found that the caliphates you know have corrupted uh, islam to be uh, an aristocratic society with uh, a devoted population. So, uh, you know, nonetheless, you know, religion is, is uh, considered to be a, a personal matter uh, and uh, the Jewish Bundry is, uh, re remains neutral on whether or not one should uh, take a position in favor or opposed to a religion or religious practice. But in any case, uh, uh, we recognize that there's an important, you know, uh, resource uh, a rich uh, resource of consciousness ingrained in the religions that we should be appealing to to fulfill because religions in and of themselves cannot fulfill the goals that they have set for themselves it will take the political socialist revolutions to do so yes Kara um, what's it uh, can't we also look at the, the, the interesting relationship and as a way that like social revo social revolutionaries you know we can really reach out to people who do have religious beliefs whether we are religious or not ourselves by looking at the fact that you know when you look at what the caliph the 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 romans um the the zionists and um well there was a group before the zionists that also did it to judaism i mean you had like all sorts you had this frankism as well and all sorts of weird reactionary mm -hmm. things that have kind of trashed uh judaism in this way they're all opposites. They're all like mm -hmm. the complete opposite of what these things describe themselves as. 
fucking a, 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 a camel has a greater chance of running through an eye of the needle than a fucking rich man has of fucking marching his way up into heaven, you know? Like, that motherfucker burn, and yeah, all these people that are, like, the bourgeoisie are, like, fucking, like, Christians in, like, the UK, and, like, fucking... Uh, they all think they're going to heaven, you know? Uh, it's that Protestant update, you see, where they're um, allowed to earn money now, where they just kind of, like, were like, well, we can just keep this part on. I'm sure no one will really yeah. question it. Um, but the uh, fucking, um, well, it wasn't meant to be like that at first, but the English decided to do Protestantism, and you all know where that goes. Uh, but the um, fucking, because Protestantism is actually was supposed to be a progressive move against Roman Catholicism. <laughs> where do people think the word protest comes from? But unfortunately, it got dominated by the ruling class again. <laughs> yeah, a state religion, yeah. Statist. Well, that was when the, the first... state religion aspect of it was starting to really yeah. be born, because that was when you got Henry VIII um, putting, uh, not really a proletariat, but some form of a productive force together to build, like, cannons and stuff. It was more like slavery than anything. It was like, in, like semi-industrial serfdom, which sounds like... Huh wild but uh, welcome to the the 1500s, 1500s <laughs> yes well, uh, there's I a theme that i want to... yes the 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 the, um, the origin of protestantism um huh. is around the same time as you have the origin of um a, a very first uh, industrial proletariat um in the textile sector in the the, the, the manufacturers actually in Flanders, um, but then the, the piece of Flanders, which is now in France, um, um, and the the the, the um, first Protestant um, uprisings, popular uprisings, were actually um, led by a proletariat that was no longer a um, feudal uh, peasant class, but they they were people who worked in uh, manufacturers, and uh, it, it's it was one of the first proletarian struggles. But at the yeah. same time, you had like the reformation of Luther, which was a, a very bourgeois reformation. It uh, it wanted to um, cleanse the church from all the feudal elements, but not to make it a, a, a democratic, popular, proletarian church, but to make it uh, a bourgeois church where the new the new ruling class that was ready to express itself um, would find its. Of course. Um, the theologians as Luther, it was all about yes, but you have interpreted this wrong, and but the people around Luther um, directed him towards this uh, uh, very bourgeois uh, um, reformation, and which immediately clashed with the the the, the, the Protestantism of Munzer, which was um, a, a very proletarian. Um, uh, so you had you actually had a war at some point uh, between the the the. Montserrats, the, the the proletarian proto-socialist uh, Protestants, and then the the Luther, the the um, I think it was Engels who used the term um, Fürstenreformation, so the, the reformation of the princes, uh, and Volksreformation, the, the reformation of the people. Mm -hmm. oh, and I think the more yeah. I, I examine this, every time that you have these recuperation movements where the ruling class is trying to take over uh, a, a very popular yeah. prophetic movement, you immediately have a, a split. It's not that they are able to completely take it over. And actually, the very first thing they have to do is uh, physically liquidate their competitors. For example, yeah. Zionism can only exist by... Um, physically uh, struggling against um, all forms of Jewish blood. If you if, if you look how they treat um, Haredi Jewish people, um, the, the brutality yeah. of the Zionist state against or against any um, openly anti-Zionist Jewish person, that's uh, that it, it's very clear that um, it cannot tolerate the the original anymore. So it has to physically uh, liquidate it. As soon as the um, Constantine and the, the emperors after him had made Christianity the, the official state religion of the empire, they they were forced to um, violently persecute uh, all the churches that they deemed heretical. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as the caliphs took over in Damascus and, and tried to make Islam once again a ruling class religion, they were forced to... Um, quench all the uh, uh, or crush all the the the, the uprisings in blood the the uprising of uh, imam hussein of 
Ibn Zubayr, of, there were many. Actually, if you look at the, the, the first century of, of, of Islam, um, especially after the death of the, the second Caliph Umar, um, you have a constant struggle of the old ruling class, the, the Ben Umayya, um, who had lost their power in the Islamic revolution to take it back. And the only way they can do it is by murdering, physically uh, liquidating the, the, the original movement. Hmm. Yeah, Kara. With the conversation about Protestantism, there is the Calvian, uh, the Calvinist elephant in the room as well, because they're even worse than the Lutherites, because they have this like very like slavery driven mindset to how they did their approach to capitalism because they like the the germans were going on the path of protestantism because catholicism was getting in the way of capitalist developments everyone says it's about henry the eighth because he wanted to get married again but he literally <laughs> just killed them like why would he care like he would just poison them and have them all of a sudden i don't know they died and just marry again he doesn't give a shit what the, the pope's gonna do come and spank him like, I mean, he literally just decided to tell the Pope to go fuck off one day. Like, I think he'd be fine. I don't think he's that worried. So, like, people need to stop taking what the British keep dribbling down their throats and fucking, like, uh, look a little deeper because the reason why it actually happened. And um, weirdly enough, a TV program actually mentioned this before uh, called Time Team, um, where uh, they went to one of these sites. Um, the, uh, what's it? So... When they changed to Protestantism, they went and purged the priories. They didn't kill everyone in them. They just kind of, like, kicked everyone out. Like, it sounds so much more aggressive when you say purge. But, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I enjoy giving people just a little bit of a break. But the, uh... Yeah. <laughs> what's it? Me and me Stalinist jokes aside. Um, the, uh, uh, the priories had been purged, and they were turned into uh, productive facilities. So these places were used to produce cannons for ships and other stuff like that. And basically, they used these former monks as um, more like serfs than proletariats. I mean, they, they, would, they would be what would soon be the proletariat, but they are like, they're like in a serf, serf file relationship. It's not like they're being paid money, per se. It's more like they just work to get food and, and other means to survive. Uh, it kind of depends on which different priory we're talking about. Every priory was ran however the fuck whoever owned it decided to run it. The bourgeoisie are brutal class, um, albeit to their uh, progressive programs. They kind of took advantage of a move that was coming from the lower class already uh, because the serfs were already pretty riled up by the time the 1600s came along. If you look into groups like the diggers, you can see the real development of who was the revolutionary group of the bourgeois revolution. I, I think, you know, Black Marxism, I'm going to turn it here, but Black Marxism is a really good book for people to read. It's by Cedric Robinson and actually gets into all of these things of like how Marx is kind of a way too rigid and how he kind of just determines capitalism as the progressive formation from feudalism. Is capitalism more progressive than feudalism? Absolutely. But who was the progressives in the struggle of the British? The bourgeoisie or the diggers? The the ones that pushed for no uh no no private ownership over property, like communal ownership over property, or or Cromwell and his fucking brutal monarchy that he basically formed around himself, where he made himself dictator in chief and fucking started like going against the Christian religion because he he knows that like. He's one of those like cool kids on the college campus that knows that like Christ Christmas is uh, actually a pagan holiday, and so he went and like tried banning Christmas, which was a really <laughs> fucking unpopular move. It turns out. Yeah, I mean, he tried to like found Christmas. his own religion. I understand uh, some kind of a pre-Protestant or whatever. He was like he's like Protestant plus or some shit. I <laughs> yeah, don't know, like, yeah. It's he's like the 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 deluxe edition you get. But yeah. what, what, what we see with this kind of like, um, you know, wild relationship and how Britain formulated itself is the very mannerism in which Britain applied itself to the waves. You know, like they, they, they were sending letters to America asking them to stop owning slaves in like the 1760s, but then like couldn't even fucking finish like 
chattel slavery in their own empire until like the fucking eighteen mm. hundreds, and it still technically mm. exists in it. They just don't. Mm. We don't do it ourselves, which is like you know, bullshit because it's like a company of a company of a company, and like all that fucking bullshit. Like we, mm. I know how this fucking like snake and ladder shit works. Where's my tissue? My nose is itching. okay. Um, I'd like to introduce a theme uh, today. I'll, I'll I'll give you a development of it. It's this on the current state of the revolutionary struggle, we have to make an evaluation and we have to sort of know what the prospects for a successful revolutionary struggle are or the impediments uh, that prevent us from achieving that. And I see a parallel uh, developed, uh, which is uh, similar to that of the Spanish Civil War in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Lebanon now. We're facing a very powerful enemy with superior material force that is being supplied by a, a highly productive center. As uh, the uh, monarchists, you know, were supplied by goods from Nazi Germany, but not from the uh, Soviet Union. So, in the same way, uh, the arms are not coming in, you know, to uh, to Hamas and and the West Bank and. Uh, and to Hezbollah, there is no sort of immediate, you know, material aid being provided, you know, to these uh, frontline uh, in uh, resistance uh, forces. So, what's the prospect for them under such conditions? The prospect is that they will be smashed. They can tear for as long as they can, but you know, the Zionist uh, uh, desire for another Nakba is actually gaining popular support now. Netanyahu has more popular support uh, today, uh, you know, than he had, you know, last week because of the uh, fascistic uh, uh, adventures that he's engaged in in Lebanon. So he's got his granite column of support, and there is no uh, current program that deals with the concerns of those who are providing support to this fascist regime. <laughs> First of all. The arguments used, you know, by the Palestinian solidarity campaigns against Zionism are ineffective. One, because they're false. And two, because they don't uh, uh, develop uh, <clears throat> a program for the Jewish people. Because if they want the Jewish people to abandon Zionism, then they have to provide an alternative, which they do not. The only alternative that they're providing in the form of the one-state one group which are ex-CPers with some red lips, is uh, that of assimilation, that they would become Palestinians in a one state, and there would be no national identification other than that one state, which would be called Palestine. Well, that's completely idealist. Okay, what's the uh, the, the uh, all, uh, Jewish Bundes, you know, uh, proposition for a program to undermine the uh, base of support that Zionism has is calling for a federation in which each nation would have their own recognition and their own autonomy in the form of their own government, their own schools, their own religion, their own language, and their own police. But not an imperialist army with an empire to boot. So uh, I think that many more Israelis would find that appealing rather than being told that they cannot be Israelis, which is not going to go anywhere. So you know, there's a lack of program in the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, a lack of uh, stature for the Jewish opposition, which is composed of various organizations representing different generations of Jewish oppositionists, yes, but they're not speaking in the name of the Jewish people. They're speaking as Americans. Yes, I'm an American. And I say that, you know, you can't accuse me of being anti-Semitic because I'm Jewish. That's it. That's all. That's as far as they've gone. You know, it doesn't work. That doesn't work. Because they're just, you know, proposing an assimilationist program to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people, even Jewish Americans in the uh, great majority, you know, like 90% are not going to go for it. You know, they want to be Jewish. They want to be American. They want to be both. But then it's not going to be American first, like it's being proposed by this, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, so-called progressive movement. They're not progressive enough because they don't have a program. If without a program, they're not going to make any headway in the Jewish people. And that's the crucial sort of granite column of support that has to be undermined and has to be vaporized. Now, 
That's another idea, but you know that's basically the problematic that I'm presenting. Yes, Red was. I, I think I, I don't hundred percent agree with your analysis. I think your analysis was correct um, until like about a year ago, but in the last year, I have seen I've seen two major shifts in the the, the Jewish communities in the diaspora. First of all, I'm not Jewish. I I have a view of an outsider, so please take it with a grain of sand. Um, but um, I've seen that there was a, there were roughly when it comes to Zionism three groups. There was a large group that was pro-Zionist, from very extreme to just uh, a moderate pro-Zionist. Then there was a much smaller group of anti-Zionists, and I think the largest group of Jewish people, especially in the diaspora, were like non-Zionists. Like we don't care. Please don't speak about Zionism. It's not. It has nothing to do. This is actually what some of the Satmar uh, uh, rabbis are saying. That please don't speak to us about uh, uh, Zionism. It has nothing to do with Judaism. We, uh, but. I've seen a shift from these non-Zionists to anti-Zionists over the last year. And I, I have the impression that there are far more anti-Zionist uh, Jewish comrades today than there were a year ago. And a second uh, um, beautiful shift that I've seen, especially with the young, um, not my generation and the older ones, but the young Jewish people in their 20s, in, in their early 30s, they are rediscovering Judaism, the culture, the tradition, the religion, but they're rediscovering it as a, a, a source of progressive activism. The, um, there were uh, Hanukkah celebrations the, with uh, uh, a resistance theme against uh, the Zionist uh, colonization. Hanukkah is a, is a great story to speak about that because who are the original, who are the, the native inhabitants, the people who are called Palestinians, and their struggle against Zionism is very comparable to the struggle of the Hasmoneans against uh, the, 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 the Greek uh, colonizers. Um, there, there are uh, every week there are anti-Zionist uh, Shabbat uh, 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 gatherings all over the world. Um, Pesach, there have been so many um, anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist uh, Pesach seders uh, in 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 the last uh, year that I've never seen that before. Like this Purim, I, I I've seen. Um, Actually, every special day in the Jewish calendar is be is being used by uh, those people of twenty years younger than us who are rediscovering their tradition and rediscovering it as as a protest tradition. So, of course, this should be much more, and inshallah, it will grow and it will grow fast. But I think that the growth has already begun. Yes, and the Zionists don't care; they don't care about uh, Jewish Americans being in a protest, you know, on their university no, campus. No, but the it's the is, is, Israelis but... that are swept away by the national chauvinism and by the brutality that they consider to be fulfillment of their national uh, desires, and they yeah, but... they've translated their uh, national identity into this, you know. Frankenstein monster, you know, that's like a golem in, in Jewish, you know, legendary. You know, they've created this monster that is supposed to protect the Jewish people that is doesn't know what it's doing and it's just going around and attacking everyone just for this own sake. This yes. year, I've read three short stories by young Jewish comrades um, mm -hmm. about the golem, and the golem is always a metaphor for the same thing we will build something very strong something very violent to protect us and it's turning against us and yeah. what is it a metaphor for zionism so this yeah. is really um and this is logical the jewish people have been oppressed for uh, uh, centuries and centuries of course this tradition is a, a treasure trove of uh, anti oppression resistance uh, ideas and, and and tropes and and and, and metaphors and symbols and just like the Bund rediscovered them about a century ago, a new generation. And they're also, they're not just rediscovering the Bible and, and Hanukkah and Purim. They're rediscovering the Bund also. And there is a revival. There, People are, if you look on Duolingo, ling languages like Yiddish are popular. You Jewish people want to learn Yiddish. Actually, for the first time now, in, 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 in quite some time, there, there, there seem to be more um, Ladino speakers today than there were in the previous generation. So, um, and uh, I try to look at the things dialectically, which, which to me also means that I like to look at the seeds that are planted because those are the things that will grow. And, and the big plants of today, Tomorrow they will be withered away. So you have to look at the things that are small and that have the capacity to grow. And I believe that 
um, here in Belgium, there are groups, uh, especially in, 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 in America, but in the Netherlands, there are also, there's so much okay. beautiful uh, activity going on in that community now. Yeah, I mean, the UK as well, like, um, you know, uh, I've seen plenty of Jewish people specifically stating that Israel is a state that does not exist in the Jewish name and that is a violation against it. And these settlers do not define the battlefield, you know, like they they are invading someone else's land. This is the Palestinians battlefield and they will be removed from like power. You know, they are going to lose. Like, that's the kind of situation that is. Israel's kind of signed its own destruction in the way in which it's operated from its birth. Actually, before its birth, really, you know, the 1923 is, or really 1919 is the big spicy of the conflict. Um, where the British occupation. Started to get their yes. way with the British occupation. But how, um, although they, how although the to British get rid of the Zionist started moving state? against them pretty much after they made that deal. The British backstabbed everyone that they made the deals with because they're slimy little bastards. Who would have thought? Yeah, they made their deals with both sides. But they made deals with like all sides. It wasn't just both. Like that that implies two. It was more like the everyone that they could sign a contract with the cheeky bastards like yeah. the sneaky little yeah. shits they are like you yeah. gotta be careful with the british and the six peacock uh, agreement which was a secret agreement was only discovered when it was found by the bolshevik revolutionaries when they took over the kremlin and they found a copy on the desk of the czar <laughs> that's how it was discovered <laughs> what? What? incredible that's that's too good that is uh but I think it's a really important facet of it where, like, the like we look now um, at the, the failures to build United Front struggle for years, and yeah. then this intifada has been, like, at least the building blocks for that. People need to capitalize on it. I still don't think it's been capitalized on enough to actually form a proper United Front, but the language that's being used by the organizations that are running the Palestinian Solidarity um, and uh, uh, campaigns and organizations are like the um, uh, are, are speaking the language of United Front. So like if revolutionaries actually like built further onto this and expanded it forward, we could really have an actual like anti-fascist, anti-imperialist United Front on the go that mm -hmm. like manages to actually reach out to the lowest of fucking uh, people in society because that's where we need to actually be reaching. Too often do communist parties sit and then just lavish in the luxury of the petty bourgeoisie and maybe some of the liberals can come join along too. And they don't actually reach down to people like myself who are in poverty. Mm -hmm. This United for, uh, Front is actually already forming on the streets um, in the meetings. Uh, and in, it, it's, it's a very queer front in, in, in the meaning of a very uh, uh, atypical, very special, uh, I think the, the Hebrew word for uh, apart and special is Kodesh. So it's a very holy front um, of queer people, Muslims, Jewish people, feminists, uh, black liberationists, all those who have been um, discarded by the official uh, progressives are reuniting on the street. And there was there's discussion about who who said the quote that everything today is made in China except courage uh, that's made in Palestine. I don't know who said it first, but I would like to add that this year they made this courage an export product and they've exported <laughs> it all over the world. Oh. Um, a few well days said. ago, yes, right I, I just came home from a, a very uh, a, a beautiful manifestation here in Ghent. Um, uh, all night we have been marching. Um, people were calling uh, only one solution, Intifada Revolution. And then I come home and I see exactly the same thing happening in New York. I see exactly the same yeah. thing happening in, well, of course, in Sana. Everybody is, is, is jealous of what's happening in Sana, where they have millions and millions every week, every Friday. Um, Intifada is an export product. Intifada revolution is something that many young people all over the world are now working for very consciously. We, mm -hmm. uh, 
of course there have been many aborted revolutions and we shouldn't uh we shouldn't be too optimistic and especially we should we should remain very active but i think that this is a movement that it, it it's very possible that this will bring real change certainly in 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 palestine but if 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 the american empire loses its crown colony in palestine and it loses uh, its proxy war in uh, uh ukraine and um they will be much weakened also and i think that the the, the american imperialist led world order um is slowly vaporizing um uh while something new will be born and I think it's up to us, up to all the, rev not, not just the three of us, but the millions of revolutionaries to make this a real genuine socialist revolution and to learn to work together. I mean, uh, 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 um, Leninist, Stalinist, Maoist, Trotskyist, anarchist, we have to learn to, to see um, what are all our strengths and how can we create synergy between these different traditions. Because I'm afraid that um, if we don't succeed in that, okay, then, then this American-led imperialism will just be replaced by another imperialism led by another superpower. And there are a few who are already, um, the, the, there is the, the, the Chinese um, monopolist bourgeoisie who are actually a part of the Communist Party right now. The, the, the Chinese Communist Party has like all the spectrums of uh, all uh, classes are united in it. Um, but the, the the Chinese monopolists, uh, they really want to be the next uh, America. Um, the the um, capitalist oligarchy around Putin, they also would like to be able to to expand more than they are now able to. Um, so it's possible if, if the, the American empire falls that we get just a, another form of imperialism, yeah. or if we are able to nurture this global intifada, then this may be the, 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 the last uh, of the big capitalist uh, uh, convulsions that we will ever notice, uh, that we will ever uh, live. Just briefly, let me sort of intervene here. Sure, and then sure, you can sure, speak. you can go ahead. And, and that is, uh, uh, <clears throat> these are all beginnings. These are initial sort of phenomena that are going to grow. We know. Yes, I agree. But um, uh, nonetheless, the, you know, when the international revolutionary movements begins to grow like that, and then one movement, you know, in one country sort of, you know, nurtures, you know, the growth and the credibility, you know, of the movement in another country, you know, like this is all sort of interrelated. And the fascists know this. And the fascists are going to take action to forestall any development of this nature. And right now they're in a position to be able to do so. I myself was charged with writing and the free Palestine. I'm going to trial on January the 5th. And, uh, you know, people are just being, in, in England, you know, people are being sort of arrested, you know, for speaking out. Like uh, uh, yeah. uh, Bradhurst, uh, I think is his name, yeah. who was just arrested at the airport when he was returning. So, you know, like the repression it can easily come down to destroy, you know, everything that we've, you know, started to build up. And uh, that's what they did, you know, like in the student the, encampments, you know, they were arresting people and they were sort of you know, uh, being violent with people. And they, uh, and there's even, you know, one international African student uh, who's uh, being uh, 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 deported, you know, because he's lost his uh, position at the university and because he had a, 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 some, an S1 uh, visa certificate, you know, that if he didn't have his, you know, uh, academic enrollment, then he could be deported. And he is... So, you know, like, they're willing to go that far. And they can do it. You know, the fascists that are draped in liberal clothing, you know, right now, and are running the world, well, if they can smash us, it's possible. And I've, I've seen it done in my own family. You know, that's why I'm so pessimistic. So we have to realize that that's possible. And we have to be able to prepare for it in some way. And uh, in terms of Palestine, what my strategy is, is that when I, uh, I'm able to go back, you know, I want to be able to uh, provide the facilities for the international volunteers to come, like in the Spanish Civil War, when there was the international brigades. We need international support because uh, the Zionist soldiers are not in a position to be able to fire live rounds at any and every international volunteer, even though, you know, they just uh, killed one international volunteer, American Turkey uh, national, and another, you know, got shot in the leg. And uh, 
with a live bullet. But nonetheless, you know, like this has gotten a great deal of world attention. And so the soldiers know that they can't get away with it. And so, uh, you know, that would help, you know, to get all the international volunteers to come there. And if they want to make it into a fascist struggle, then we will take up arms and we will fight against the fascists as well. But we need the international support in that way because the other states, the other Arab states are not providing it. You know, maybe the Yemenites, you know, and, and Sarala, you know, are sending volunteers, you know, to st and stationed in Syria right now, ready to take on Israel in the Golan Heights, maybe. But Turkey, which promised to send troops in to Lebanon to forestall any, you know, Zionist invasion of Lebanon. I haven't heard anything about that. No. No. And, and I listened to his whole speech at the UN, you know, like a long speech, you know, he's talking about using, um, using, uh, what, the, what word did he use? Force? Not force, but to, to uh, oblige, coercion. He said that, mm -hmm. that the Zionist state, and he used the term Zionist state, the Zionist state has to be coerced into complying with the General Assembly resolutions. But they haven't provided him any help. <laughs> Even after the uh, volunteers on the uh, Mamura ship, you know, were killed. And, you know, uh, uh, Turkey uh, uh, martyrs, you know, in that episode, and nothing was done about it except words. So, you know, I don't see that we have enough strength to forestall the fascist offensive that is underway. And we are under a fascist offensive internationally. In the Ukraine, that fascist offensive, you know, began, you know, like uh, early. And uh, gratefully, you know, it is, uh, it is, it is, you know, being weakened, you know, day by day. But, you know, they don't give up. They have to be destroyed. You know, fascism cannot be sort of tolerated. There, can, there is no sort of agreement, you know, to forestall any offensive from fascism. This is the lesson of the ribbentrop molotov Pact. It doesn't work. It only leaves us defenseless. We have to be ready for a struggle of the ultimate nature. And in Palestine, I'm going there to do that. I think that... Um... Yes, the fascists will, and more and more governments will become openly fascist, and they will do everything they can to, to destroy us physically. But after all these thousands of years, the ruling class has still haven't learned what is the real, what I call the dialectical mystery of martyrdom. That there was um, by the end of the nineteenth century, there was like a, a young romantic boy uh, in in Russia. His name was uh, um, Vladimir, uh, uh, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, uh, and he was actually he was interested in in poetry and all these romantic things. But he has a brother who was quite a revolutionary, and that brother was murdered by the Tsarist state. Well, Vladimir mm -hmm. Ilyich Ulyanov, just a few years later, he was known as Lenin, and he led the, the Bolshevists. Um, if the ruling class murders every time they they try to silence one of us, there are five of us who are, are who are getting up. And I'm not saying that we have to look for martyrdom, or that we have to look because, because it doesn't that wouldn't work. But every time that they murder us, people see it. And especially now, we live in a time of social media. Um, this is what's what's happening in Gaza is the first massive martyrdom that is being filmed, that's being live streamed. The whole world is seeing it. And this is having an effect. And I, I, I'm and of course we have to be very vigilant because um the first generation of activists, let's call them like this, the first generation of, of, of this uprising, many of them will be put in jail. Many of them will have like fines that, that will ruin them financially. Several will actually be killed. Uh, but people are seeing this and people are fed up and, and people see that um, we haven't been able to solve the, 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 the crisis of 2008. We haven't been able to solve the, 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 the crisis of the 90s. We haven't been able to solve the crisis, the crisis of the 80s, the, the, the so-called petrol crisis. Capitalism is going from one deep crisis into another and people are seeing this. People are feeling this. So, Yes, but in a I'm country always a little bit advanced. more optimistic, but... yes. But in the country with the most advanced, you know, political movement in France now with the United Front that just won the election, yes. look how easily they are just brushed off, you know. Another government, conservative government, you know, coalition government has been proclaimed prime minister from the rightist party that lost, you know, in the election, you know, is now the prime minister of the country. All because they know 
that if this United Front comes into being a government, they will carry out the recognition of the state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. This allows for the radicalization of people. Like, yes, of course. But, it causes but them, they're being stopped. It causes what, like a formation of that is meant to cause, which is to show that these institutions are not. Sure, the people will get more radicalized as a result of this debacle. Will, yes, in France, where they violated their own constitution. Yeah, but so, you know, what are they doing in response? They have a petition campaign calling for the for the dismissal of the president Macron. Okay, they have a petition campaign. Very nice, petition. you know. Well, petition. Oh yeah, let's have a petition campaign. You know, but well, what about a general nicely, strike? You, you know? know, what about the labor movement? You know, like is that is it there? Are they connected with the labor movement? Are they a labor united front? Are the united they, front no, with the unions? Yes the or no? The movement is so what it's doing at this given time of moment. Well, you know, like the labor movement. Okay, what's the labor movement? The labor movement is the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, even though they they um, have the nothing Communist in terms Party of, of France. They wouldn't call that the labor movement. It's more like the. Head up your ass. Um, we'll help the government, Macron's government uh, movement. Uh, yeah, you know, for some favors, like, shut support, down you know, social right media. To sure, stop why not? You know, mass uprising. They, yeah, they can claim a victory, you know, to their members, you know, like, and then keep on getting elected. Sure, yeah, no problem. So I, I don't, I don't know any other country in Europe that has a labor union like uh, the CGT. Which is um, Centre uh, Central General de Travail, which is a communist. Basically, a communist uh, uh, labor union, and they're still active. They're still one of the biggest and strongest uh, unions, and yeah. they don't care about what this or that communist party is trying to tell them. They know what they're fighting for, and and they're still really a, a force to be reckoned with. So, um, yeah. I uh, it would have been very nice to have these uh, a progressive United Front, uh, front as a government. But it's not in a government that you'll be able to change the capitalist uh, system. It's it's on the streets, and I think in all, in all of Europe, France is still the country where they have the, the 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 strongest tradition of fighting in the streets, of having big strikes. And um, remember the, the the yellow vests of a few years ago. That 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 really scared the the the, the French bourgeoisie. That that really scared the European collective bourgeoisie. Yeah, sure, but that's not good enough. That's just, you know, dessert. I want a main meal. No, but it you know? shows that there's something to be really actuated upon. Like, you know, if we're looking at this in the fact that there was something I really wanted to say about this. There is instabilities with it, because there always are with these kind of united fronts where there's a bourgeois component. Almost, which gets way too much, like, uh, hyperfixation on, in my opinion, both in the sense of, like, those who, like, are constantly slamming it, and also, like, leftists that spend all of their time defending it, rather than talking about the actual intifada, like, where you have communists and all sorts involved in this shit. Hamas is an ally out of convenience, not an ideological or, like, uh, you know, social, social political ally. So, like, there is a point of confliction, and that point of confliction is going to be something that always comes up in a united front struggle. We can look at the history in all united front struggles, whether there's been a social democratic or liberal component to it, you know, as to separate that from revolutionary united fronts where you have, you know, communists. Um, I mean, I'll say anarchism separately, but as far as I'm concerned, anarchism and communism are words that are describing the same thing. But yeah, you know, like the the revolutionary crew. And we're all in a united front because we have a coalescent of ideas and we push as far as we can go until, of course, at some point, someone's going to argue with someone. It's going to be a big fight. Uh, hopefully it doesn't turn into shooting each other and we we have a big fallout or something like you know we should be able to resolve it you know let's not turn into the Adams family but jokes aside um obviously like there is like a vast difference between these two categories of united front and i don't think people really tend to consider that i think we kind of blur the lines between the two and there is a stark difference between them the current situation we're in at the moment we are likely going to be getting into democratic Social, social democratic united fronts like, led by Marxists or, or like you know revolutionaries in general that's what you would want anarchist Marxists or them to be like leading these kind of fronts so that these fronts from the bottom because you really want to be organizing them you know fronts from the bottom above but 
there is a dynamic of having to engage with both concepts of united front process where you have the from above to below which is the way the social democrats do it so we have to like approach these things in a dynamic fashion so we can pull social democratic workers into the revolutionary side so that when we separate and then the the, the that separation is when the the revolutionary united front really solidifies itself so rather than it being just like the Second International, where you had the Bolsheviks separate from the Social Democrats, and they're just, just the Bolsheviks and the, the Bund and the, and the anarchists, but they're all against each other. It's a collaborative effort as we separate from the Social Democrats, making us much stronger to compete against the bourgeoisie and like squash their uh, the petty bourgeois influence over the proletariat much easier. And, and confuse them. If there are, uh, uh, if there's like a big movement led by Bolsheviks, and then there are like all these small movements by anarchists who do something completely different, and one of the things that I've learned now is a great tactic to uh, uh, avoid uh, police persecution is to flood them, have many actions, so they don't have enough people to arrest everybody, or they don't have enough space, or um... oh, yeah, there are and tactics. Yeah, I, I believe it in the UK. Yeah. Huh? They targeted parts of the UK where they would um, have an easier chance trying to beat the police. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I agree that this current period, you know, is a revolutionary upsurge that surpasses that of the 60s. And I was there in the 60s, since 66. And, but the 60s, you know, revolt, uh, more of a cultural revolution than anything else, and the anti-war movement at the time were completely absorbed when Nixon abolished the draft. As long as there wasn't any conscription, then Americans you know, were content to let the war go on until the Vietnamese themselves won. So what we have now, okay, is bigger, a bigger phenomenon, but it can still be absorbed. And it is being absorbed in France, as I've made the point, you know, that the political movement, you know, is not being backed up by the labor movement. The United Front has to become a labor movement a labor united front, uh, not necessarily led by labor alone, because they're usually the slowest, you know, to come along. But there has to be, you know, the labor component in there, otherwise they don't have any force. Petition's not going to do it, it has to be a general strike. And they're not doing it. Communist Party and Socialist Party, you know, because it's not their thing, you know, they're not leading the united front, and therefore they don't care. You know, they only care about their own political party. That's the problem. The problem is the political party, as far as I'm concerned. Down with the party. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, there was a, a Chinese Chinese poet, um, and at some time he became the head of state also. Um, and he said, "It's always if Marxism is clear on one thing, it's always right to rebel, and you have to bombard the headquarters. And um, uh, revolution is not a crime." So, wh yeah. when Chairman Mao was removed from the center of power. And he saw that there was uh, a fast bureaucratization of uh, the, the, the whole socialist system in China. Mm. Um, he saw that. And uh, several students uh, at Beijing University and at other universities saw that as well. And they started rebelling. And they immediately had full support of Chairman Mao, who said that uh, um, even if it is against a communist party in a socialist uh, country, um, you always have a right to rebel to make things uh, uh, because you will always have this bureaucratization. You will always have uh, uh, bourgeois and petty bourgeois elements that, that rise to power in every bureaucracy. So mm. um, uh, I think we need, the, uh, we, need, we need parties, um, but we have to be able to. Um, I used to be, when I was young, I, I was in a, um, a Bolshevik party and the party was everything. I mean, Marx, Engels, Len, all, all, all the five, we had like the five heads and... Um, we idolized them. And then mm. for some reason, um, God called me to become a Muslim. And, and I started recognizing this is idolatry. I am making um, a God uh, out of an organization that was invented by human beings and out of people who are long yeah. underground, if they're not in yes. some kind of mausoleum. That's um, why Islam and Judaism forbid, you know, uh, visual conceptions, you know, of a deity. Yes. It, it, it's, um, the, I think that, 
one of the things that I learned and, and why, but most of my atheist comrades are, are a bit allergic to it, but I think that we can learn a lot from good theology as revolutionaries, because there are lots of things that if you translate them in these terms, like if you look at what is what is the, the, the problem of idolatry, which are the idols of the, the revolutionary movement, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. You have party and ideology, and uh, but you also have things like purity. We are we're the most purely Leninist party, and all the others are wrong. Or the, mm -hmm. these uh, and these are all um, there. There was um, there was this a bit of a fringe uh, um, anarchist in the time of Marx, um, Stirner, and he had a concept of I think it, in English it's translated as spooks, a kind of ghosts, ghost spirits of the mind. And a lot of things that are very real to us, um, Marx spoke of reification, that we've made them into a thing. Well, Stirner said, there's books, there's just ideas in your head, the state, money, these are just ideas that you've been learned to see as, as real things, as, 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 uh, but they're just uh, ideas and we can easily uh, overcome them. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you have to say, Kara? What? So, what Kara, it, yes. With, um, with the whole like way that a lot of this stuff all relates, the Cultural Revolution was something that happened way later than it should have. It was um, it was a point of like radical re um, adjustment of how Mao was poisoning himself towards the revolution because he had gone down a Dimitrovist path and it had actually compromised the revolution. The bourgeoisie were able to be members of government and it led to even more toxic bureaucracy than what was seen in the Soviet Union. Um, that that was why like the Cultural Revolution in China was a lot more aggressive in how it was poignated compared to the Cultural Revolution in let's say Albania. Uh, which started uh, a year after the Chinese Cultural Revolution, 1967. Um, with this uh, poignant relationship, we've got to look at the, the uh, Soviet Union and the Chinese uh, People's Republic had both gone through similar um, issues in that early development. And that was that the country was in such a feudal state that there needed to be a different approach from the Communist Party and how it formulated the socialist state for a temporary period. And it was supposed to be temporary. And that was that the Communist Party would engage in government. And that was supposed to stop because as Lenin, Stalin, and pretty much any other Marxist that has their fucking head screwed on properly will say, is the Communist Party is supposed to take an advisory role and then I mean, members of the party can run in government. The people who are functionaries in the party should be functionaries in the party. They have a responsibility to theory and praxis and putting things through. Because if the party is separate from the government, it means if the government gets corrupted, because bureaucracy is the main point. If we look at like a lot of the problems of corruption and revisionism, bureaucracy is not only the main point of source for a lot of it, when we look at the new bourgeoisie that developed out of the, the proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie, or I should say former petty bourgeoisie, um, but also when we look at the um, the uh, the revisionists and how they themselves took advantage of bureaucracy to do this, it's two ways in that regards. And so when we look at this relationship, the separation of it into an advisory, which was what Stalin himself wanted to do, um, is an actual like important facet of the party itself. And if the party is to remain in government for as long as it did in the Soviet Union, you yeah, goddamn it's right to rebel against it because it shouldn't be in there anymore. The fucking proletariat know what they goddamn well doing, so they goddamn well need to be running the fucking government. You know, that's the way that the process is to be going. And then if the government becomes reactionary, which it might possibly will, because bureaucracy is a fucking poison, the Communist Party can actually be a fucking institution that people can rally around for revolutionary change to prevent mm. the revolution from being poisoned rather than being the source of the very fucking poison. Like, mm. that's the thing that actually inspiring us so angry, but that's the shit that, like, really fucking pisses me off. Because, like, the, no one really questions this facet of the party. Like, there's even some people that will mention that thing about Stalin, but they never really go deeper than that because, you know, it's about breaking that commander's scroll because that step back was an issue where the party was having to take. I mean, it was, they were still a voting system, so it wasn't like they were taking a dictatorial commandist mindset towards the people, but it was still 
getting in the realms of that if they were not to cut it short. That's why 36 was, like, the point where Stalin was, like, time out, you know, on this shit, you know, like, the industrialization is in full swing. We don't need to be, like, you know, mummying the government anymore, like, and that's, like, that fraternal principle. Like, we, Marxism, and, and it needs to be built on a, on a fraternal principle and not this fucking, like, patriarchal shit that Stalin himself did play into the, the fucking silly wanker. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Marxian terminology, but the um, <laughs> roofing commentary. But that's the problem that I see with the the kind of the chauvinistic perspective, especially that the petty bourgeoisie like to purvey onto Marxism, where they they take the the mistakes of the Bolsheviks and the and the and the CPSU, and they turn them into the print the, into their own principles. They abide by them as if. They are like fucking rule of thumb because they can't seem to think with a fucking semi-critical, let alone actively critical mindset. Like it is this complete like dislocation of the movement, and those kind of thinkers risk damaging our struggle. Now we do need to still form collective united front struggle with them because they represent a part of the left. But we need to be careful because they are a part of the left that are equivalent to social democrats in how they operate and so we have to be careful of how they themselves can poison the movement but also see where we can push the needle and get some of these people who might be caught up in this shit because they think it is actually principled marxism and get them to think on a much more principled basis about this very core historical conundrum to why marxism failed in both china and the soviet union you can really source it to this bureaucracy associated yeah. with the party yeah well, so we've opened up a discussion on the party. So that's a big <laughs> topic. Yeah. Okay, so oh, we can God. leave it at it's that for now. It's such a fucking nightmare topic. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, each of you, for participating in today's uh, Convergence Forum. Thank you. And uh, we'll meet again next week, of course. And so... uh, if we have any concluding remarks... Uh, to inspire people to work, this is the uh, time to do so. And I would call upon uh, you know, uh, Jewish people to be made aware of the fact that there is a Jewish movement uh, that is contiguous, you know, with the original Jewish Bund from the Warsaw Ghetto that they can become involved with in order to make an alternative to Zionism and not just a uh, rad lip critique of uh, that phenomena because we're dealing with a bigger problem than has ever been thought of before. Okay. And, and Kara, yes, Red's Wasp. I, I just, one, one small detail to end with, um, a, a beautiful illustration of what's happening in some Jewish communities. Um, a very young, I think in his 20s, rabbi that I know from the United States, um, a few months ago, he sent around uh, a brocha, a blessing oh, yeah. specifically made for if you want to burn a, an Israeli or an American flag. <laughs> um, because I, and actually, I the whole it. idea of that broche is that um, you're doing an act of uh, destroying idols, which is actually something that that's a mitzvah. You have to do it. Yes. So, yes. They, they're they're re principle. rediscovering things that. I'm happy that I'm still alive and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave me on this planet for a long time because there are evolutions that I would really love to see how they're going further because I, yeah yeah I believe we are right now we are Moshe we are, we are, we are Moses peace be upon him on the mountain and we can already see the promised land and maybe maybe we will be able to cross the, the river okay poetic people I like that um, okay, Carl, what, 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 what do we have to look forward to? I mean, you know, look at the rhythm of the movement and how we have escalated in the last year. You know, actually, look the last four years. The uh, ask the uh, Alex of flood. You know, we have this period of time where there has been this ramping up a genocide that has not been the last year like everyone seems to be implying like um it, it's been a really rough period it was actually the um it was the 
it, it was the the storming of the mosque um, that was what brought me back into the the protest movement and got my feet back wet and muddy and started getting back on the on the dot because my health had gotten me like out of the uh, out of the communist movement and I was on my ass for like quite some fucking time and the um what's it this the the uh, uh the the protests then were not very big the 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 air on the protests was not very loud you know people were ignoring us we were being pushed aside we weren't even doing the thing where we were blocking the roads and other stuff like that nada 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 we were just like doing the usual march around the block and other stuff like that. There was still plenty of people. It's not like there was no, like uh, just a tiny amount of people there. But you go and compare that to the like hundreds of thousands to millions of people that I've seen in person protests. Like, you know, I, you don't know a feeling like being around a million people chanting. For a fucking free Palestine, and I like, fucking marching through London, there was so many of us. We outnumbered the right in fucking droves, absolute droves. So if we're looking at the revolutionary movement moving forward, there is a lot of shit we can radicalize upon, and like everyone trying to push for like accelerationist principles, like and like the people that want to just like, oh well, you know, who cares, like. You know, just let Trump win, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, let, let's look at what we've got right now. We have right now, compared to back then, a incredibly powerful, incredibly radical movement that when I was in London, we were chanting, um, you know, about like sending the settlers home and shit like that. We were chanting Intifada Revolution. We were chanting... You know, all sorts. We were, like, fucking, you know, when people say from the river to the sea, it's not like it was with a lot of people a few years back where they were saying some liberal two-state shit at the same time because somehow people managed to hug their bad ideology in. No, people had pictures where they wanted Israel gone. And that was the main message of most protests in this country. There are not many people in this country that are going, yeah, two-state solution. Most of them are going, fuck off, Israel. And so, like, all these Doomeristic Marxists that can't seem to get their heads out of their ass and actually like look at what the revolutionary movement is providing to us. I think people need to look deep. They need to look deep and they need to look hard for what the Palestinian Intifada actually represents for the people's struggle as we move forward on into revolutionary organizing towards revolutionary action. Okay, well, we're doing it. That's for sure. And we know what we're doing. So that's what counts. Okay, good. Can I just, because um, yes. Comrade Storm made me uh, think of something. I would like to suggest a theme for one of the next sessions. Yes. The no state solution. Because um, oh. as much oh. as I hate Zionism as an ethno-nationalist uh, idea, I, I don't I don't believe in nationalities in, 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 in the way that they were invented in the 19th century and the Palestinian nationality doesn't exist in a Palestinian state. I think that all these states, all these nation states that were created um, last century in uh, West Asia, they should all disappear and that yeah. land should be reunited as it was um, for more than a thousand years. Uh, so... I would like to propose that uh, theme of the no state solution, uh, inshallah, for one of the next. Yes, very good. In fact, that's the subtitle of my book, The Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations. That was the purpose of that book, is to propo propose a program, constitutional program, uh, in precision, with precision, that goes beyond the state and uh, is called the no state solution. And uh, there's a book that's just been published by Yale University Press by Daniel Boyarin, with the title of which is the no state solution published by yale university press of all presses you know like it's a it's a phenomenon that uh, i saw repeated even on al jazeera by one uh, academic who mentioned it as well so it's a phenomenon that is uh, developing and that is very revolutionary whereas the one state solution is just a bourgeois liberal solution you know that it won't work in any case 
I mean, the Very thing good. you always Okay. see that's the really big, that's the really big problem is people, you know, Palestine, you know, is like a very Romanization of the situation. Palestine um, is, um, you know, it also involves Lebanon and Jordan. Like, Ah. Palestine is the, the ancient land which used to be Canaan. That's called the Levant, I think, as well. The Levant, Yes. yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Okay. So we will continue next week. Okay. And it's been a pleasure to discuss with you each.